All right. So I'm going to take you through uh, this blueprint and you will, for the rest of the day, you will be working on this blueprint. You will take the brand that Johan's going to introduce to you and you'll be working on this blueprint. And in your platform, you will also get a copy of this blueprint. So it's not necessary to take copious amounts of, of, of notes on the blueprint. All right. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a holistic picture that you can just take one look at this picture and you know you will get all of the elements of customer experience so i'm gonna i'm gonna take you step by step through this this blueprint and i might tell you a few story and a few uh a few examples that'll help you just really understand this so if we and um, that wasn't supposed to happen uh, that was also not supposed to happen let me just quickly see why my presentation all right so if we start with the world of the customer, very often when I speak to uh, large corporates, uh, whether it's some of the banks that are in the room today, and I ask them about the customer, they tell me about their segments. All right. And what they've done with their segments is they've made it very neat. So sometimes they call them names like, uh, emerging market and typically they have identified an income level and they might have attached some persona to it like emerging emma something like that all right but what they've done with these segments is they've made them they've made them incredibly neat all right so i always giggle at the you know our customer is female she's between the age of 25 and 35 i tell you i've been 35 so many times now uh i've been 35 like almost 15 times all right and um <laughs> you know they say the longest the longest 10 years in a woman's life is like between 39 and 40. all right so um they've neatened up the customer in such a way that they 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 no longer human and what i want to do this week is I want to uh, refocus you on getting the customer to be a messy human being with, with issues and with fears and with problems and with challenges. Because from that place of empathy, we can really start designing well for the customer. All right. So I want us to look at the customer through the lens of what are their needs, what are their goals, what are their fears, and what is their story um, and there's a lot more going on in the life of the customer than just you know your product so we do not want to look at the customer through the lens of our product we want to see them as a human being with needs and then the product will satisfy some of those needs or solve a problem for them all right so if we then move on to the world of the employee we pay very little attention to what's below this waterline, all right? We normally focus on the customer. It's the sexy stuff. It's the things we can see. It's the things where the CFO sometimes just buy, buys it because we can see business results. But what's even more important is what's below the line, all right? And the employee, again, we look, we don't look at them through the lens of, you know, them being a human being. And I know there's a lot of companies and we've got some HR professionals in this group that are doing stunning work around refocusing on the employee, looking at the employee journey, looking at the employee value proposition. But what I've seen in many environments is we look at the em employee through a lens of compliance and the rules that govern their employment rather than looking at them as a human being. And I think one of the things that COVID's done is showed us all of the rules and all of the things we didn't think was possible before is now possible. All right. So again, I'm going to ask that we look 
at the employee through the lens of their life. And, and it's very rare that you'll find um, employees and customers just being an island. You know, we might create a persona and, and give them a name, but usually these people are part of a community, part of a family structure. And we need to also take that into account. When you employ someone at your company, you don't just employ them, all right? You employ their husband, you employ their children, you employ their extended family. You are essentially employing a family unit. Um, and we don't pay enough attention to that. Uh, we had, we were preparing for a customer workshop for next week, and we had put together workshop kits um, that we packaged in boxes. And I had my, I call them my brand love team of interns, that, that's also my children, but they just feel like a lot more important if I call them the brand love interns. So I had the brand love internship team here um, on Friday. They were all packing boxes for our clients and they were putting stickers on and they were putting snacks in the boxes. And, um, you know, afterwards, my, my middle son came to me, typical middle son. He said to me, sure, mama, that was so nice. That was like the best thing I did this week. And you know what? We work really long hours. You know, sometimes our children don't see us for, you know, weekends on end when I was writing my Amazon book literally my, my kids you know i could have been in another country um but they understand because they're part of the they're part of the team all right so we need to start reframing employees in terms of you know the systems that they belong to and looking at them in terms of their needs their goals their story and their fears and everybody have a everybody has a story all right and the stories impact how we show up. Great. So the next thing I want to show you is this little bottle of secret sauce. All right. And I call this the, the brand experience essence. And every brand has this. Uh, sometimes we don't like what's in their essence. Uh, but every band have, have this. And it's very rare that I walk into an environment where you know, people are clear and where they've articulated this because this is not your marketing punchline. All right. This is this goes deeper than that. The, this is a emotional statement about who you are and what you're trying to do. So what's all packaged in this, you know, the ingredients of this essence is a company's uh, vision, their purpose, their goals, their mission, their strategy. You know, some of the risks, so many environments, I walk in and I, and, um, you know, I have this weird feeling and, and I'll quickly tell you a, a, a secret of how I, how I assess what's really going on inside a company. And some of you have been subjected to this analysis. When I visit any new client of brand love, I make sure that I arrive at the meeting at least 20 minutes early. And then I go to multiple toilets in the building. All right. So I want to go to the toilet closest to reception. All right. And then I want to go to a toilet close to the canteen or the lunch area. And then if there's a fifth floor where the carpets are nice and thick and there's bonsais, I want to go to a toilet on the fifth floor. All right. And the type of clue scanning I do is I look at the signage against the walls. I look at the general state of the toilet and I look specifically at what's behind the doors of the toilet, because this gives me, and I promise, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm tongue in cheek, but I'm not joking. I've literally done this probably for the last five years. I've got photographs and artifacts of things I've collected in toilets, of which probably the funniest was, and I'm not gonna name the brand, but the funniest was female condoms. We actually had a little team gathering and we, we, we just laughed about the instructions on these things. So um, the toilets give, us, uh, give me a, a really good sense of what's happening in the culture. If I have a sign behind the door screaming at me, telling me in detail, micromanaging my bathroom routine 
and I go into the boardroom, I find exactly the same thing. So it's very subtle, but that's part of the essence. And what I'll do later in the chat, I'll, I'll, I'll post you the most detailed instructions that I've ever gotten. I'll, I'll show you a picture of, of what I got in, in, in one of the companies that I've, that I've visited. So this essence is really important because if we've articulated this well, this becomes our design guidance. This becomes the principles that we're going to design against. So I can't send you away on Friday and say, oh, go forth and create magnificent journeys. What are you going to create? What are you going to, going to create against? All right, what is the experience that you want to go and create? What I don't want you to do is go away on Friday and make every moment in your journey delightful, all right? Because you're going to fail. It's going to be expensive and you're going to get it wrong, all right? And you're going to feel like a failure when you can't afford, you know, to build all these things into your technology. So we don't want to just build the light into journeys. We want to be very clear about the essence that we want to pour into that experience. And once we've got this essence, we will put it into every email, into every system generated document, into every form, into every call center's tone of voice. So this essence is really like a perfume. If I strip off your brand, I take away your logo and I take away your colors, okay? And I take this perfume and I spray it on every person and every artifact inside your company. I need to be able to know this is Nedbank, this is NCBA, this is KCB, this is Capitec. All right, so especially I'm talking to our banking colleagues because you have a big challenge, all right? The, you, you deal in a market where, you know, a bank account is a bank account and you can call it gold and you can call it platinum, but I'm not seeing massive differentiation. All right, so we need to get clear about this essence. And then we've got a whole lot of stakeholders in our environments and you're going to be doing stakeholder mapping a little bit later if we don't get to stakeholder mapping today i might give that to you as an assignment after the course but um it's really important to consider the stakeholders so there we've got our shareholders type type into the chat what do you think shareholders expect from a brand from a business what do they expect And then our next, our next, yeah, they want money. Okay, they want return on investment. Our next uh, stakeholder here, suppliers. What do you think are the expectations from the brand with regards to their suppliers and from the supplier to the brand? Because I can tell you, I've evaluated a whole lot of uh, companies before, and sometimes they prioritize their customer experience but they treat their employees badly. And if they treat their employees well, sometimes they treat the suppliers really, really badly. We, we, we did business with a brand a few years ago. And you know what they would do? They, they would totally ignore the supplier's uh, payment terms. And if they pay you within 30 days, they automatically uh, reduce the, the, the payment by 10% because they're paying you quick. That really screws up a supplier's accounting. Okay, just no consultation. Just if we pay you within 30 days, 10% discount. All right, so we need to look at the stakeholders in the environment and be consistent. So the next thing I wanna look at is the, the employee below the line, employees don't function in isolation. They're usually part of a team and they usually have a leader. And I asked our illustrator to tongue in cheek, draw the leader like the king. Because there's a couple of things wrong with that picture, all right? People see the leader as the person who's going to come and rescue them. Uh, but they also see the leader constantly as the villain in the story, all right? So the boss is always the villain, but the boss needs to rescue. But you know what? The boss is so scared himself. And what COVID has showed us is that some of our leadership approaches don't work. And we need to reinvent it. And a lot of leaders that felt like imposters before, you know, they are now 
they are now totally out of their depth and they now need to move, manage teams remotely. One of the things that I think COVID has showed us is if there's cultural fault lines inside your organization, it's now been exaggerated. All right. So leaders who micromanaged before are totally freaked out because now they can't see people. And remember, a lot of the mentality, if you're not at your desk, you're not working. All right. If I can't see you from outside of my glass office, you're not working. All right. And what are we seeing from employees? And I want to, some people in this group, I want to say, I love you, but please do not log on at two o'clock in the morning. All right. You know who you are. And if you have insomnia, we need to talk. All right. Because there's amazing, I'm, I'm a terrible insomniac. So if you have insomnia, we need to talk, but you, it is not healthy to log on at two o'clock in the morning, but we are doing that. I'm getting emails at really, really weird times, all right? And if I do send emails at weird times, which I really try not to, I schedule those, those emails because I want to quickly just give you a secret, just tell you a secret. If you send emails after five in the afternoon, all right? If you send emails after eight in the evening, if you send emails after 10 at night, people get used to it, all right? Whether you intend for them to see the timestamp on your email or not, they see that timestamp, okay? It's a, like a subliminal thing. And they go, all right, I saw Patrick send some emails after 10 last night. So now at 10 o'clock, I'm thinking, oh, I need to remind P Patrick to do that. So I blast off an email and immediately I've got an expectation. Oh, I saw an email from Patrick, Patrick two days ago at 10 o'clock. Patrick's going to, he's probably online. Let's see if he answers my email quickly. So I had a client which he, he knew my morning routine because I had shared that with him in conversation. So my morning routine, I get up at five. Usually I write. Um, sometimes when I'm un, under pressure, I ca do catch up work between five and six. And then I walk on the treadmill or I do, I do a little bit of active work. And this client knew what my morning routine was and he saw me sending emails at five o'clock in the morning so what he did on three occasions he asked me he had steering committee meetings he needed some reports and he asked me just after five on an email for a presentation he had at nine o'clock that morning all right and i have a problem i struggle to say no all right i'm a pleaser i'm a rescuer and you know i want people to like me so what did I do the first two times he asked me? Yay, at five o'clock in the morning, someone needs me. Okay, I'm such a junkie. Someone needs me. So I did it. All right. And then the next one came and I moved from superhero to resentment. I cannot believe he's doing this again. All right. But I trained him. I trained him to do that. So then I had to have a conversation with him saying, you know what, Lee? I'm not going to answer your emails that time of the morning. That's my catch up time. And then I started scheduling all of my emails. All right. So we need to look at some of the rituals and some of the practices we have in our organization. And if you feel bullied because people demand stuff from you after hours, it's most likely because you've showed them that you are available after hours by sending email at that time. All right. So. I want to move on to the business design. So our businesses, and this by far is going to be one of your biggest challenges. All right. Most of your organizations were not designed to be agile, changeable, innovative, collaborative. Some of your organizational leasels going like this. Some of your organizations were designed long ago. All right. Liesl, how old is how old is NetBank? Do you know off the Come top on, of your head? 150 years, guys. I'm I'm okay. like really long, <laughs> really old. <laughs> all right. So 150 years ago, we did not have WhatsApp. <laughs> all right. We did not have emails. I'm not even sure whether we had typewriters. All right. So some of the legacy of just how the organizations were designed have stuck with us. Uh, for a for a long time. All right. So you need to go and look at these pieces. 
And we heard Rosalind yesterday mention they've just had two organization designs merge. All right. And that's really hard because these two organizations didn't look the same. All right. They're not clones. So now you've had two organizations, the business design have merged and these pieces of the one and pieces of the other one. And some people have come around and some people haven't come around. And what has emerged on the other side is possibly not something brand new, but it's a mishmash of the two organizations. And some of those things might work really well, but some of those things might be in conflict. All right. And then you've got this recipe for, you know, some people are excited. Some people don't know how they feel about this new organization. And some people go, this is crap. I want to go back to the way it was. You know, why did they have to come and mess up a, a good environment? All right. So that's the challenge that Rosalind was, was, was mentioning yesterday. So we need to look at culture, structure, contract, system, identity, processes, environment. The culture is apparent through the language we use, the practices, the rituals, the values and the stories. And you're going to be doing an exercise around that later today. So when I thank you so much, Purity, I'm watching, I'm watching the, the heads up there. Um, so when I give you the assignment this morning, I want you to pay attention to language. All right. I want you to uh, give me look at the words people use. All right. So in most of the banks, let me quickly, uh, I'm going to give you a quick example and then I'll, then I'll start wrapping. So you know the compliance messages that's on the on the interactive voice system when you phone into a call center uh, saying uh, um, you know we're a licensed financial service provider um, we service you on this line but we are not uh, able to give you advice all right some people would say on the phone if i ask them so which package do you think i should go for they go i'm not allowed to give you advice all right. What does the words I'm not allowed to give you advice mean to someone who's not familiar with financial services compliance requirements? In the chat, tell me what does not allowed mean? Does that not take you back to, yeah, disempowered, don't want to help me, don't want to service? You know, for me, yeah, for me, it uh, it takes me back to being in school, being like seven or eight. And, you know, I'm sitting in the corner. I'm not allowed to go and play outside. So someone's not allowing me. All right. So, you know, there's much nicer ways to explain that saying. I'm going to I'm going to say exactly the same thing, but I'm going to use different words. All right. So let's say Seema wants to make an investment with me. Uh, but I don't have the right licensing. So I will say, Seema, you know what? Your investment is so important to us that, you know, we require people that deal with investments to write special exams. So I'm not in a position because I actually don't have uh, the knowledge and the experience, but I'm going to refer you to someone who does. I've just said the same thing. I've just said, I cannot give Seema advice, but I can give, I can tell it to her in a much nicer way, going to the purpose of what I'm saying, not just the compliance requirement, but we've become so scared in organizations that we just focus on the rules. We don't focus on the reason for the rule. So the reason for the rule is investments is a very, very specialized skill. And therefore, you don't mess with people's money unless you have the formal qualifications and the background and the experience. All right, Marley, thank you for that. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we know that salicitis thing. All right, so let me finish the rest of this. So now we get into the customer journey and we're gonna spend a lot of time on this. Thursday is pretty much ring fenced for the customer journey. And what I'm gonna ask you to do on, on Thursday is I want you to go to the end of the story, all right? What does the customer say once they've had an interaction with your brand? How do they feel about themselves? All right. And some of that's going to go into that speech bubble. 
And then we reverse engineer and we say, okay, where does this journey start? What's my catalyst? What's my customer's need? What do they do when they go shopping? How do they compare? How do they decide? How do they actually buy? When they use the product, is it true to the promise? And when they get stuck, what does it feel like to get help? And then when I exit that journey, because I'm going to try and keep my customer in that journey, I'm going to try and, they call this in financial speak, maximize the lifetime value of my client. All right. But I want to keep them into that, in that journey. I don't want them to have any reason to go anywhere else. Same for my employee journey. So we've got some HR professionals in this group. And in your employee journey, you want the same thing. What do you want them to say about how they feel daily in their jobs? All right. And then we look at the journey step by step, moment by moment. When I start with a company, how do I join? How do you initiate me into your tribe? How do you contract with me so that I know what you expect of me and that you know what I expect from you? How do we inspire people? How do we grow people? How do we co-create with people? How do we appreciate people? And when I leave this journey, do I leave better than when I started? I listened yesterday to Augusta and one of the things that crossed my mind is when we join a new company, even if we stalk them and do great research, you know what? There's so many times that I started a new job and I absolutely lied to myself. I found stuff that I didn't like about this company. And it's like you so badly wanted to work that you just ignore. It's like a new relationship. You know, you, you meet someone new and, you know, the first time they fought, you go, oh, it's just human. It was a little accident. And then you and then you realize, listen, they're fighting like all the time. It's just bad manners. But you lie to yourself. You go, OK, maybe maybe they just they just flatulent in, in anatomy. I don't know. I don't know why, why, why. But but you know what I mean? You know, sometimes we lie to ourselves because we so badly want it to work. All right. So we will spend less time on the employee journey. But I want to say to specifically Crystal and Mariette, the principles are exactly the same. The principles that you're going to apply is exactly the same. All right. So the steps, and I'm concluding now, the steps. When you want to make this change, you need to enroll your players and your spectators. All right. So some people are going to be actively involved in the design you're going to be doing. And some people are going to sit on the sidelines. All right. So your spectators, some of them will cheer you on, but they will be the critics. Okay. And the critics will try and hold you back. The critics are very afraid. All right. The critics are afraid of failure and success. So they're going to take every opportunity to say something about what you're doing. All right. And you need to love them. You need to, at a meeting, you need to let them speak their minds, all right? And then you need to thank them for keeping the company and keeping the initiative safe because that is, that's essentially what they're trying to do, all right? Some of them are quite egotistical, but essentially they're just voicing fears, all right? So use your critics wisely. So the next piece is you need to go and discover, and pretty much today is our discovery day. You are going to stalk brands. You, when you do your research, you can call them, you can Google them, you can call a friend. I don't care how you get the information, just don't use any illegal methods or espionage of sorts. I don't want you to go and spend time in jail after this, but you are going to discover as much as what you can possibly discover about the brand you'll be given. Then I'm going to give you a chance to distill and boil down who are they and why are they. So have a shot at an essence statement. I want you to boil and distill until you get the perfume, all right, that we're going to spray on everyone. And then from tomorrow on, we're going to start reimagining and discovering novel ways of winning the hearts and the minds of both customers and employees. So we're really going to get into the mind of the customer, and then we're going to design new journeys for them. And then I will guide you on how do we actually make this happen and how do we activate this. All righty. So that is our experience-oriented enterprise blueprint. 
questions. And you could just raise your raise your hand in 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 Zoom or just unmute yourself. Let's get a few questions. What do you think of the model? Let me let me get let me get a bit of feedback. Tess, you like it? Oh, you've yeah, seen it I mean, a few times, um, eh? Yes, I have. And you know what? I get something new from it every single time. And um, something that I think that it's is always so powerful for me, Chantal, that you really do with such care and respect is to, you know, I mean, I think, and I've certainly fallen in this trap before, and it's not necessarily model related, but enterprise related, where with the with the FD, with the boss, with the leader, whatever, and you kind of, you just think that they're out to get you, you know, for whatever reason, you know, and it's, it's really not about that. And it really is about bringing those people closer and, you know, really having empathy and also care and also respect for them and understanding where they're coming from. And um, I mean, the same is also for the customer and the same is also for the employee. It's never just at face value, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's something that really, that always comes, you know, um, strikes me when, when I see these things. And it's always just, you know, it just embeds and it just keeps reminding me how really important it is. Now we've lost that, you know, in a lot of organizations. All right, stunning. Thank you for that. Seema, I see you've got a fantastic question. Let's, will you ask it so the whole group can hear? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, morning, everyone. I just wanted to, to I, I love this blueprint, and that's one of the, the key reasons why actually the team from NCBA has, has signed into this program, because this is what we want to come out with at the end of the day. I think the challenge for us has always been around getting everyone on the same page and, you know, all the multiple stakeholders that we have within the organization and how to get them to see this winning formula of the blueprint and how to get people to work together and to all kind of align um, and evangelize around this um, around this blueprint. So that's that's basically the, the challenge and the question that I wanted to ask. All right. So for Seema's team, all right, you need to now you need to now pay full attention because I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to tell you exactly how to do that. So when you leave here on Friday and I'm going to make it very practical. All right. Book a two hour session for next week for your team. All right. Take one of these collaboration boards and do stakeholder mapping. I'm gonna show you a little bit later how to do stakeholder mapping, all right? And you are gonna map all of the stakeholders in this environment that need to be on the bus with you. Then you are gonna prioritize them and you are gonna prioritize them in terms of the stakeholders that you need to be involved and the stakeholders that have high impact on this initiative. Then, Create a collaboration board for you. Uh, I call it a war room. So go and create a stakeholder war room for your team, Seema. And what you need to do is let's say you end up with 10, 10 stakeholders that are really important to this initiative. And I don't want you to map groups, all right? So I don't want you to say, okay, we need the compliance team, we need the legal team, we need the actuarial team. I want you to give names to these people. So I want you to say, we need Peter to be on board with this initiative. It is very important that Peter attends our meetings, that Peter understands what we're up to, all right? So then you are gonna do empathy mapping for Peter, all right? And we're gonna show you empathy mapping in detail tomorrow, but at the core of empathy mapping, all right? If Seema needs Peter to be engaged in this initiative and not to shut her down and not to not listen to her team's ideas, she's gonna ask a few key questions, all right? She's gonna really get in Peter's shoes and she's gonna ask, what does Peter need from my team, all right? She's gonna ask, if Peter wakes up at three o'clock in the morning from stress, what is Peter stressed about? What is Peter worried about, all right? What what does Peter most fear in the work environment? What does Peter most need in the work environment? And how can our initiative help Peter minimize his fears and achieve his goals? All right. I promise you, Seema, if you do empathy mapping for your 10 
highest ranked stakeholders, it's going to be a game changer for your team. All right. And there's nothing wrong with having a conversation with a CEO saying, Bob, what keeps you awake at night? Tell me. There's nothing wrong with asking those questions. If you don't know, and if you feel we're doing too much guesswork, ask the question. All right. So that would be getting empathy for the people, because I can tell you the CFO. All right. We, we heard some comments about the CFO yesterday. If the CFO is breathing down your neck about money. OK, he's doing his job. He's doing what he gets paid to do. All right. He's not mean. He's not evil, wicked, mean and nasty. OK, he's just doing his job. He's being held accountable to make sure that the organization spends money wisely. And unfortunately, we've attached this really nasty persona to them. OK, he's just doing his job. So my conversation with the CFO and what I do in the presentations I present, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, towards Friday, I build a slide for every one of the exco. All right. There's a slide in my presentation pack that speaks to the CFO. And that slide starts with, hey, you're probably worried about the money we spend. And because some of the stuff is perceived as soft and fluffy, you're probably worried about the return on investment. Let me reduce your worries. This is how we're going to deal with it. This is what we're going to do. All right. If I'm sitting in front of an exco talking to them, I build a slide for the head of service. I build a slide for the head of the contact center saying, you probably worried that this journey we've just come up with needs to land with your 2000 people. You probably really worried about the training initiatives and, you know, getting the hearts and the minds of people to, to switch. And I speak to that. All right. So we need to start speaking to our audience. The reason why they are hampering and why they are posing risk to our projects is because we're not communicating with them. We're not engaging them actively in what we want them to do. And I give you my permission. You will have this blueprint. All right. If you need to print it, put it in your slide packs, use it as a communication mechanism with your people. That is why I created it so that you have a powerful tool to communicate. All right. And we're going to be using that blueprint for the rest of the day. And I'm so delighted. There's a ton of blue hands open. So Chantal? Rosalind, um, yes. Chantal? Yes, go for it. Wabi? Um, just a quick one uh, before it gets lost yes. in the chat. Edith had a question. All right. Um, All right. Maybe she can say it me? out loud. Or can I can read it for her, Edith? Okay, let me read it for her. She says, great concept. Right. My challenge would be how to bring in the need for employee journey mapping without looking like you are stepping into the HR role. Oh, nice question, Edith. Sure, let's not go for the easy questions this morning. Let's just hit me with a really hard question. All right, so um, I think what I, what I see in organizations is uh, just an assumption that we've got territories. All right. So sometimes we back away from things because we think we're stepping on other people's toes. All right. I want you to remove that limiting assumption because we do a whole lot of stuff. We, we don't do a whole lot of stuff because we're scared on, uh, about stepping on people's toes. So I'm going to I'm going to ask for a little bit of help on this uh, in a while, Mariette. I'm going to ask you just to share with us maybe some of your thoughts on this. But I would position it as follows to say, you know what? After this course, if you get back into your environment, Edith, and you are passionate about the employee journey, you take this blueprint, you go to your head of HR and you say to them, I've just been on this course and I really want to share with you what I've seen here. And you know what Chantal Boeta in Brand Love believes is that the employee journey is a lot more important than the customer journey and that we are not going to succeed in orchestrating amazing customer journeys until we've paid attention to the employee journey. Now, 
Mr. Head of HR, I know that your job is people. And I wanted to come and bounce this off you. And I feel very passionate about this employee journey uh, concept. Could I run a workshop with your team to share with them what I've learned in this course and to show them a few of the techniques? Because I think if I give them the skills that I have, we can make an amazing impact in your environment and we can empower you to really shine as the head of people. So Edith, that's the conversation I would have. I would go to him literally with this gift of these skills and say, I would love to share with your people this thing that I've been given and this thing that I think can transform the lives of our people. Because if you make employees happy, you make their families happy. And that's why Brand Love, we've got a program called the Brand Warrior Program that I'll, I'll tell you about, about uh, towards the end of the week. And that program, I designed it five years ago. My team are just wonderful in running this Brand Warrior program. And we impact hundreds of lives, if not thousands of lives through that, through that program. Because we work with groups of 18 people, but they have 60 people in their immediate family. And they have 600 people in their churches and in their communities. And all we ask of them is take the skills we teach you and go and teach it to someone else. All right, Edith, I hope it's answered your question. Excellent. So let's go to, I've got four hands up, Rosalind and then Sheila and then Nancy and then Joyce. So Ro Rosalind, you can, um, you can unmute yourself. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, I love this blueprint because for me coming in from the brand side, I'm, I'm getting a great appreciation for how the brand experience, customer experience and employee experience come together so beautifully, seamlessly. Um, and for us, um, and I'm building on Seema's question, whereby we are, you know, essentially a very young brand. We're only about a year old. Um, and all these priorities are balls that are in the air due like yesterday. So there's a brand we're landing. There is a customer we are reorienting to this new organization, not the one that they came from, because they too are in transition, also missing the banks that they came from. But, you know, we have to create that experience that begins to point them to our new future and then there's this employee who, again, doesn't come from the previous banks. This is a new bank and with, with, a, with a new vision, with new values. It's a new, it's a new bank. So we are all trying to point in this forward um, direction. Um, all everything is a priority. Everything is happening now. The, the good thing is that um, we are all working together. So where the SEMA within the team from customer experience, brand, HR, um, and all the, you know, the culture work that's underway, we're all working together as one. Um, but there's just a lot of balls in the air and a lot of things in motion. So I think my question was more around how do we institutionalize this? Because like we said, there's just a lot going on all at the same time, everything has is of priority. Um, of course, the desired future is that it all comes together beautifully. I think that's where the true, um, you know, magic will be experienced in all the different facets. But how do we carry our stakeholders with us as quickly as possible? How do we um, institutionalize this so that it's truly something that is felt in the hearts and the minds of everybody? Um, and and you know, almost to some to some point, how do we prioritize all these things? It would be different if we were talking about an established business, but this is a young business. So I just wanted maybe your yeah. thoughts, reactions, yeah. you know, there's just a lot. And um, yeah, so, th so that would be my question. All right, so, so let me take a shot at this. So I think our ways of priority, prioritizing things are outdated. So I would challenge you to say the things that are in your top priority list, are they really top priority? So are you thinking like a startup or are you still thinking like, you know, the biggest bank in Kenya? So I would just say, 
challenge your priorities because sometimes we are doing things uh you know very very vigorously um but not necessarily asking the right questions all right so i know you've been busy with a lot of technology integration and you know that's been like really uh focus and it's been challenging and you know getting people from one platform onto another is, it's never a trivial is never a trivial exercise my guidance would be if you can gather the village all right instead of relying on a few key individuals you're going to make everyone's job easier so you've got to work with the hearts of people You've got to activate your entire team. All right. And again, this is not in any slide back. So grab a pen now, and I want you to write down the following. The way you get someone to change or do something. Okay. There's only two ways you can get someone to change. You make the pain so big that they don't have a choice. Okay, you inflict so much pain that they don't have a choice. They have to change. All right. Or you make the pride so big that they cannot resist, but move to a place of feeling incredibly proud. And that's not in any research. That's the world according to Chantal. If you want someone to change, make them feel the pain so that they change and move away from the pain or you move them to pleasure and pride through being super aspirational that's the that's the only two things and to share with you personally okay you can paint beautiful pictures of you know how i'm gonna feel you know when i get up early in the morning and i go for a walk and you know by tomorrow so the pleasure thing doesn't work for me at all okay the way that i change is by someone telling me i'm shit at something and i want to prove them wrong or an exercise that marley and i did recently is just taking the bad habits and the lifestyle i choose right now and showing me where i'm going to be in 10 years from now if i happen to live that long all right the pain of that made me change instantly okay the pain of seeing what life's going to be like like this i chose a different attitude okay i actually choose to jump out of bed in the morning all right so so that's how you that's how you make people people shift and i think if you apply these principles marily's laughing at me if you apply these principles um i, I also want to say the design tools we're going to show you this week you can literally design anything with it okay you can design your life you can design your next family holiday you can design your interaction with your children you can design your interactions with your partner all right we carefully designed the session for you okay i could have been on my chair the whole day yesterday and i could have given you like 50 powerpoint slides and you probably would have said, yeah, this is kind of what I expected when I come to training. Okay. But we didn't want that. We designed every moment in your agenda and the agenda that I'm screwing up currently because I'm talking a little bit long. Uh, but we just, we designed every piece of this agenda so that we maximize your learning. And, and that's not because we cool or we clever, but we've designed it. We've used our own tools on this. All right. Fantastic. I'm going to go to nancy joyce and mariette thank you i'm gonna end off with you so nancy go for it chantal thank you for such an amazing session my question is more around um how do we implement the blueprint is it an end-to-end -end process that has to work you know like a cogwheel or is it something that can be implemented in parts the reason i'm asking is when I look at the business design, that's the part at the bottom. Um, one of the things that's very key is uh, something like systems and processes. And the way we work is a lot of the systems and processes, especially our systems are homegrown, meaning that they were built by, built by our techies in the environment. And I can already see sort of in my head some of the things that we'll need to tweak. 
But then the way our process is designed is there's a prioritization process. So if you've worked with developers, you know that the way they work is they have to prioritize things. And you find that if you're going to look at this holistically, then you might fail in the sense that when it comes to implementation, then you've got certain blockers in on the way. So is this something that can be implemented in parts or is it an end to end process that has to be implemented all at once? Because I struggle when it comes to when I look at the, the outputs, I'm, I'm like the things that are easy because they're within my control. And then there are things that, hey, we have to wait for a tech prioritization process okay I'm, I'm so grateful for this question so what you want to do and 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 it's really up to you how you do this but i'm gonna i'm gonna just give you a suggestion so take when you go back into your work environment next week take this blueprint all right and go and map all of the initiatives that you have on the go inside your organization Use one color code for the ones you have control over and use a different color code for the ones you don't have control over. Again, what we've been trying to do is not to step on someone's toes, not to necessarily spend a lot of energy where we don't have control. So I'm so glad you raised that issue because if you're only gonna change what you have control over in this blueprint, you will fail. All right, don't even start. If that's going to be your approach, don't even start because you're just setting yourself up for failure. All right. You don't have to work on everything at the same time. I'm hearing from Rosalind, they're doing a lot of, she says, they're, they're keeping a lot of balls in the air. Okay. When you have a lot of balls in the air, the chances that it's going to be a balls up or you're going to drop a ball is big. All right. So you want to first go and understand you want to do a complete discovery map all of your projects map all of your initiatives map your important people on this blueprint all right and then you go and have a look at where the biggest pain is all right an organization struggles to design be innovative if there's a ton of pain in the system okay so some of that pain might be we've just done a merger all right the you can have the cleverest techies putting systems together, but if you don't deal with people's fear, and I'm just using the example of the merger, I'm not saying this is the case with, with, uh, with you, Rosalind, but unless you deal with people's fear, you can put down a fantastic system and they're not gonna give a shit about the system. All right, so you need to go and look at the levers of people, process, and technology. Those are the only three categories of changes, okay? We love technology because it's neat, okay? We love technology because there's, in most environments, there's maturity in terms of processes, there's release cycles, there's teams of business analysts that use the best methodologies and the scariest video diagrams. And, you know, they have, uh, they have their stuff together, okay? And they're also very good with boundaries. Like, if you want this into the next release, you have to fill this in in triplicate give us a nice little urine sample and we'll run a DNA test and then we'll put it in that cycle. Okay, I'm seeing some of you smiling. You, you, you catch my drift there. All right, but what we don't do is we don't necessarily on the blueprint look at what's my people levers I need to pull? What's my processes that need to change? You know, where do I need to influence people? Going back to this discussion with Augusta, leadership is influence. You can be a leader by having the right influence. You can have the right influence by doing your empathy map, Seema, because once you've been through those top 10 stakeholders, I promise you your approach to them is going to change. The nature of the conversation is going to change. They're going to know that you're not just trying to build your own little CX empire. They're going to know that you want to empower them. All right, fantastic. Now we've got Joyce. Uh, and they, uh, Did I say Sheila and then Joyce? Now I'm confused. All right, uh, Sheila, you go first, and then Joyce, and then we're going to end off with Mariette. Okay, um, I'm I'm really really learning a lot. I have to say that the blueprint is something that I'll definitely use as soon as possible. Now, uh, my question is: Unfortunately, as uh, much as we have uh, good leaders in place, we also have bad leaders meaning we, all, we also have bad people who have the um, position, who are in position and whose, um, whose feedback um, is valuable or important in you moving in the organization. So um, 
also in conjunction with this question is um, you said when you're an employee or a leader, there's also people you take care of, like your family and your livelihood. What happens when you coming out strong and you also trying to push your agenda sometimes might mean you losing your job because the person who has the authority is just simply a bad leader or a bad pers uh, person. Like, you know, the way um, I think is it a shadow told us his uh, story yesterday. Well, there is, what are the boundaries? When, when is it time to stop and say, you know what, I have done my best. I've put my agenda, I've spoken to whoever I have to speak to and it's not working. And I, I, I need to keep my job before I get another job or move. You know, this is the reality on the ground. And even when uh, people are transitioning, just an example of transitioning companies, everyone is trying to fight to keep their job. And that is the truth because you don't want to lose your job. And that sometimes might mean you agreeing to things that, you know, um, are not your core values or sometimes keeping quiet for the sake of, you know, not being in a position of being fired or losing your job. What would you advise someone who's really passionate about this, but the situation on the ground is not as accepting um, as we all would hope for it to be? All right, sure. How much time do we have? So I just want to quickly put my facilitation team at ease. I'm confident that there's one piece of content that we would have dealt with that I'm actually going to, it's pre-recorded in the platform, so I'm not going to cover that. So you can watch it later. So we'll make up for time. Sheila, there's a couple of reframings that I want to do. And I know, I know you probably, the intention wasn't, you know, I don't believe there's such thing as a bad person or a bad leader. All right. I believe that sometimes people are in a position of authority that they don't have the temperament for, they don't have the skill or the competencies or the experience for. And unfortunately, when people get scared, they do bad things. All right. So I've, 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 um, in, if, if someone does this exercise with me to say, Chantal, in your career, um, what is one of the leaders you, that you admired? I really struggle with that question, all right, because I've got a severe judgment. I have not worked for a leader that I admired, all right? These pieces of what they did that kind of worked for me, but most of the time, I, I thought I worked for really shitty managers, all right? Now, if I look back, none of them were bad people. They just didn't have the skills, okay? They just didn't know how to work with me. They judged me. I was high maintenance. I had too many ideas. I was too enthusiastic. I was too loud. I was always too something, okay? Um, and and I, had a, I, I had a lot of heartache in my career. I got hurt a, a lot of the time. Uh, I mean, some of, some of you that are sitting in the room, that uh, worked with me in, in, in some of my previous brands, <laughs> I'm seeing you smiling, um, I got hurt badly uh, because I had, I, I had such high aspirations for the brand. And sometimes the leaders that I worked for wouldn't, wouldn't give me uh, the opportunity to implement my ideas. And, and that, was, that hurt me because me and my ideas, you know, I'm like, I give birth to these ideas and I'm, I'm heavily emotionally invested in my ideas. And that's what makes brand love so good is that our entire team, Ali sometimes asks me, Chantal, when is it going to stop hurting? Because we cry, we cry real tears for our customers. And I, and I said to her once, I said, Mali, I hope never. It must hurt until we die because hurt means we care. So Sheila, to get to your question, when is enough enough? Okay, I'm going to quickly ask all of you. All right, you ready for this? I'm going to ask all of you. Based on the vision board you did yesterday, if you had only 24 hours left to live, what shifts would you make? Would you do the job that you're doing? Would you be in the environment that you are? Would you be happy with your contribution? Are you being the mom or the dad that you want to be? Are you being the partner that you want to be? Are you being the daughter that you want to be? 
that would be that would be Sheila depending on what your our answers are all going to be different okay there's stuff that if you said to me I only have 24 hours I'll probably say to all of you cheers uh, I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Johan and my team and I'm going to quickly grab some crayons and play with my kids okay not because I don't love you or care about you but because my children I wanted them since I was like four you know, I, 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 some of my dolls had the names of my kids. Okay, so our, our answers are going to be different. But but what I appeal to you is don't put up with shit that you hate every day. Okay, because that just erodes your your soul. I left, and I'm gonna I'm gonna end off with the story, and then I'll go to Joyce and Mariette. I worked for an investment company. Now investment companies they pay very well. All right, this investment company made me six job offers before I took it, okay? They wanted me so badly that they just kept going for months and months and months. And eventually I said yes, because they promised me that they'll implement all of my ideas. People, three weeks into this job, I realized I made a horrible mistake. I would come home in the evenings and I wouldn't speak to anyone. Johan would give me a glass of wine and we've got a tree house outside. And I would walk with my glass of wine and go and sit in the tree house and cry until I got no more tears to cry. All right. I used to put on a bulletproof jacket when I went to work because the environment was so unsafe. Okay. I'll quickly make a confession that I've not made like to anyone before. I used to go to the toilet and play Candy Crush. That's how upset I was, okay? I've never played a game in my life on the job, but I used to play Candy Crush because I would be so upset that I thought I would kill someone, all right? I eventually got up one day. I had really no plan for this. I didn't think it through. I went in and I resigned, and I walked away from millions in long-term incentives, and I, they said, my boss said, I think you need to see someone. I said, I'm seeing you. He said, no, I think you need to see a medical professional. You've lost your mind. He said, do you know how much money you're walking away from? I said, yes, please see it as I'm buying back my soul. All right, because my soul's going to die here. See it as I'm buying my freedom. You know, take that money, shove it up your ass. I want my freedom. Just see it as the price I'm willing to pay for my freedom. All right, Sheila, I'm not suggesting you do any of that. Okay, but I'm saying to you, there's a, there was a tipping point where I was more afraid of carrying on the way I was than I was afraid of losing everything. I was quite happy to go and sweep the streets or sit on a pavement somewhere. Uh, I, I just couldn't do that anymore. So what I'm saying to you, please don't leave it that long, okay, because it's not healthy and it's not good for you. This, the impact on my health was severe. Like uh, some people in the room, I had super insomnia. It, 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 it impacted every fiber of who I was. And did I do great work? Yes. Am I grateful for that experience? I mean, I'm grateful for every knife that landed in my back <laughs> because it made me who, who I am. I'm even grateful for Candy Crush. I don't play it anymore, but it was stunning at the time. All right. So every experience gets you to the next experience. But I'm saying don't leave stuff too long, all right? And don't give up hope, like I can't change my environment. I can't change my boss. Maybe you can't, but you can change how you react to it. All right, Joyce. Let's hear from Joyce. Good morning, everybody. Um, since my camera is still not working, uh, you'll have to bear with me putting a photo. Now, uh, thank you so much, Chantel. This has been a very, very interesting morning. And uh, the lessons that you're sharing with us are really, you know, life, life changing. Um, now, my question was going back to HR, and it's really related to the question that Edith asked, because that's what I had um, in mind. Um, and my, my question, since you already um, talked about how to work best with HR, then could you further guide us in terms of what comes first? Do, do these two journeys, the employee, the customer journey run concurrently? 
and um, or you know one one has to come first before the other and and i'm talking about this because of issues to do with culture so in a in a perfect world in a perfect world where you've got unlimited resources and you've trained i think at least 10 or 15 people in your company on this training course i would say run them in parallel and let these teams engage with each other to cross pollinate that happens very rarely all right we've got one client who have 30 people booked on this course next year we're running this program just for them all right so i would i would really suggest that you um prioritize and uh, let me just quickly joyce i think if you can just um hit your hit your mute mute button there so just prioritize and part of your essence is culture so you need to define that essence first and then you can start often if you've got funding for the customer experience work you can drive some of this from there if you've got funding for your employee journeys you can drive the customer experience from there. So these worlds cannot exist in isolation. All right, you need to cross. You need to cross pollinate. Um, but you know whether you know some organisations spend a lot of money on customer experience, uh, but they don't do any on employee on employee experience. Are you getting a bad feedback? Someone's getting like really bad feedback. All right, let me just quickly see. Everybody's on mute. So I wonder so if it's, it's sorted now. up. No, it's sorted now. All right. Now. So, so, so it's hard to say, you know, if I don't fully understand the context of the, of the organization. But culture eats strategy for breakfast. All right. And therefore, we're going to spend an hour this afternoon doing work on culture. You, you cannot get your customer experience right if you don't work on your culture. And culture starts with leadership. One of the companies we've currently got in our Brand Warrior program, the exco goes through Brand Warrior first. The leaders go first because the leaders are the guys who need to shift their, their attitudes the most. And I'm sorry, I refer to guys. There. The leaders are the people in the organization that everyone looks up to. And most of the time, people's expectations are not met of their leadership. If I ask you, are you happy with your leadership right now? If you score them out of 10 right now, okay, it's probably going to be rare that we're going to get nines and tens. If you do an NPS on your boss, it's going to be rare to see nines and tens. All right. Great. I hope that answered your question. Mariette, finally, we get to you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Go for it. I'm just going to ask a question. Um, I think the whole conversation about EX and employee engagement and customer journey mapping, et cetera, and going together or separate or whatever, I think the important part is that we need to acknowledge that everyone's doing their part. I mean, people don't rock up in HR to make lives difficult. Yeah. We also, you know, HR people try to make lives easier, but we don't always know how to, and I think... The important thing is that we, that what my um, discomfort is sometimes it's it's new things and then we must rush and everything must be thrown out and we must do these new things. And I think what you mentioned about mapping all the initiatives in the areas that's currently happening. If you're struggling to work with HR people, it's possibly because mindsets are um you don't know how to do it, let's us tell you how to do it. And that's the first thing that you're going to get um, the, head, the backs up. So rather say, tell me about what you're doing and let's see how this is supporting us, but also show the, the other view of how, um, how the, if we can refocus the employee work, how that can improve the client work. So I think it's, and there's also something about Systems take time now. You're not going to change the world tomorrow. Yeah, it must be aligned to your strategy. And um, and I think that's sometimes where people get irritated and then it's egos and then, you know, and then things fall over and then now we sort of throw everything out. We need to have a long-term view. 
-hmm. and identify the most critical ones and start there. And it might seem small, um, sometimes because in our world, we have teams behind the client experience and the digitalization and the marketing and the, in HR, so let's say you'd have 30 people here, you have two here. So it's also about understanding that the capacity to run as in client experience world is very different in the employee world. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, but Absolutely. I think that I think Absolutely. Answer, it is about empathy, it's getting alongside people. It's about identifying the biggest trigger we can now move on. And then even if it's one trigger, one journey in the employee journey, we do in the next year, but we, we just continuously having these conversations and focusing and influencing the mindsets. I think that's the, that's the, gonna be the trick. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, Marie. So I'm gonna close off with, with one more secret I wanna tell you, like my, my recipe for success in large organizations where people are siloed, and people don't necessarily want to work together. So in my historic project inside organizations as an as an employee and as a program leader, I had a lot of volunteers on my project. On most of my projects, I had a lot of volunteers. All right. The magic with volunteers is they want to be there. They're not mandated to be there. So if there's one thing you can do in your organization is have the discussion with your executive team about letting people volunteer for projects. All right. The, the reason I got people to volunteer is I don't have boring meetings. Okay. My meetings are interesting and they're nice to come to. All right. In my meetings, I make people feel worthy and I make them feel great about themselves. So, I've designed my experience in terms of my essence and how I show up. And I sometimes, I, I grew up with, a, you know, in a very kind of pretty critical parent environment. So my language at times, I can get very critical. You can ask you, and sometimes, you know, I, I, I say something and I go, oh shit, I can't believe I just said it like that because it's a little bit of a pre-programmed. So I need to re relearn some stuff. But in meetings mostly, I try and not be critical and not judge and I make people feel great about themselves because what happens then is people go to a lot of meetings. All right. So if I look at the meetings that people attend with the brand love team, okay, they've got a zoom meeting of an hour with their team. Then they've got a zoom meeting back to back an hour with their boss. And then they meet with this person in the organization and then they meet with brand love and they feel like, oh for a moment i don't feel like shit. okay it's interesting i get up i have some oxygen they feel so much better and, and what we're doing is we're just working with their physiology and we're treating them with love and respect and we nurture them and we help them and we honestly just show up to make them successful okay then after the meeting with us they go to five more meetings and all of them are like crap okay so which meeting do they want to be in Next time I set up a meeting, I have double the amount of people showing up. Why? Because these people who had actually fun in a Zoom meeting, they've now rounded up the troops and they go like, you know what, did Chantal invite you to that meeting last week? Yes, but you didn't go. You should go. You made a big mistake. Like that was like the best meeting of the week. Okay. And then we have, we have a village showing up. All right. So that's how you do it. You design the experience so that they don't want to be anywhere else. And if you then round up enough people and people volunteer because they want to, not because their boss told them to, then you get magic chemistry and then you get experiences to change. So that's how you do it. You make sure and all of you can have interesting meetings. All right. And if you believe you can't, then you know, I'm going to make a coaching session for us to talk about that because all of you can have interesting meetings. Start with something small. All righty. So I want to thank you. I really enjoyed having this discussion with you. I really enjoyed just taking the questions and just like shooting from the hip and, you know, sharing a little bit of what's in my heart and, and how, how I sometimes do smoke and mirrors to just get the best out of people. 
Alrighty, so I believe you have earned yourself a break. How do you feel about taking a bit of a break? All right, let's have a 15 minute break. And when we come back, I'm done working and you are going to get those booties off your chair and we're going to work together. All right. Thank you, everyone.